Hi, I think we're live now. I've got the live button. Welcome to this keynote panel on sound and race. Uh, my name's Catherine Schofield, Catherine Butler Schofield. I'm really delighted to be chairing uh, this session. Um, my own work is on music, sound and listening in Mughal India and the paracolonial Indian Ocean from the 17th century through to the mid 19th century, although I do stretch back to the 16th century from time to time. Um, uh, I'm not actually going to be um, uh, contributing a great deal to this because we have a lineup of really, really amazing speakers uh, for whom sound and race are um, really important um, conceptual um, uh, lenses, amplifiers. I don't want to use a, a visual metaphor, but yeah. The sonic equivalent um, uh, in their in their work. Um, so we'll be starting off with um, with Wayne Weaver, um, who um, has dodgy internet and is stranded in I think it's the Costa Coffee opposite <laughs> uh, Kings Cross Station, um, uh, and he's a senior PhD student at uh, the Faculty of Music at Cambridge. He's just um, in the process of writing up at the moment. Um, and he's undertaking a pioneering uh, doctoral thesis on music, sound and listening in early modern Jamaica, which focuses on globalization, migration and the slave trade and the sonic and auditory impacts of that. And it really is a very exciting thesis. Wayne is one to watch. Um, and then I will be um, passing on to uh, Nandi Lidas, um, who is Professor of English at Oxford um, and a specialist in Renaissance literature, um, especially travel writing and the depiction of cross-cultural encounter. Um, and she's the project director of the ERC funded Tide project, which is about travel and um, and transculturality in early modern England um, and and she's a frequent contributor to radio, television. Um, you will have heard her voice before. Um, Sarah Dustagir, who will be next, um, is senior lecturer in early modern literature in the School of English at the University of Kent. Um, and she's especially interested in theater and performance um, in the time of Shakespeare on which she's published extensively. Um, her 2017 book, <clears throat> excuse me, Shakespeare's Two Playhouses was shortlisted for the Shakespeare's Globe Book Awards. Um, and finally, Jennifer Sturber is uh, Associate Professor of English at SUNY Binghamton, where she teaches and researches African-American literature, sound studies and race and gender in popular music. And her groundbreaking book, The Sonic Color Line, which I would recommend to any of you who are interested in these topics, um, was published in 2016. She's currently working on a co-authored article with David Sterling Brown um, on Macbeth. And um, I believe she's gonna be talking about that um, today. Um, so um, what, what, how this will work is that um, each of the roundtable participants will give a short statement. Um, and then uh, I might pull, pull out a couple of threads depending on how much time we have. Um, and then we'll go straight over to the floor. So please do put your questions um, in the chat uh, on Crowdcast um, as we go along so that they can be passed over to us um, and so that we can answer them. So Wayne. Thank you very much and thank you um, Catherine for your um, very kind words. I hope that you can all hear me um, relatively clearly um, as I come hailing exactly from um, the, 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 the cost outside King's Cross. Um, anyway, so I'm writing a doctoral thesis entitled at the moment Space in inverted commas Race and Music in Late 18th Century Kingston, Jamaica. Um, the period of focus is specifically 1760 to 18. 10. And what I'm trying to do is use archival sources to examine the social culture surrounding musical performance in Kingston then at this, in, in this 50 year period. Of course, some of these periods are commercial, some of these performances, sorry, are commercial, others are devotional. Um, some are indoor performances, some are in theatres, some are, are in long rooms, for example. And then there are others that are outside in locations like the Kingston Parade. Um, the parade would have been, or is, 
the town's central square, um, which in some ways functioned as a sort of arena or amphitheater-like space. So though my focus is on the sorts of music um, typically performed by um, the, the, the minority population, that is the, 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 the population of Kingston's um, people of European heritage, um, and, and so my focus is on music then that might typically be described as quote unquote classical or European um, today. It's actually chief among my aims is to demonstrate and investigate the involvement of people of African ancestry. Um, and that the African ancestry population will be the, is the demographically dominant population. So how were these sorts of people involved in the Kingston music scene? And of course, they are the, typically the people that are um, not discussed in archive sources in, in a way that's um, transparent. Um, and of course, as historian Trevor Burnett has explained on various occasions in his various writings, um, Kingston had more slaves, I'm quoting from him now, Kingston had more slaves and free people of colour than any town in 18th century British America, end quote. Um, it's also worth pointing out that this is a period directly um, in the run-up to Britain's abolition of the slave trade, which was ushered into law in 1807. Um, and yes, I shouldn't maybe speak too much about the individual chapters, um, but I'm, I'm basically starting with an overview of, 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 of the, um, the creation of, of white identity in 18th century Kingston. And then from there, moving to um, the involvement of, let's say, people of quote unquote free people of color um, and the enslaved population in the final chapters. And I'm really heavily, um, let's say, um, influenced by studies like that of Robert Talley's Theorization of Space, who's written a very interesting book on spatiality. And then, of course, the work of people like Marissa J. Fuentes and Sadia Hartman, who are helping me to think very carefully about how I center non-white male experiences in the various archival fragments that exclude the black other. Thank you. Thank you, Wayne. And hopefully we'll get more chance to speak about your, your project as we as we go through. And if anybody has any questions, please do put them in the chat. Um, Nandini, over to you. Thank you so much, Catherine. And what a fab company to be in, um, despite Wayne having to be in that stranded in that cafe. Um, I will talk very briefly about three different examples, I suppose, and that's partly or actually largely got a lot to do with the fact that I'm trying to wrap up a book which is due by the end of this week. Um, so my head's all over the place. Um, but I realized when I was thinking about this session that the three examples that had been constantly playing on my mind kind of span a series of research interests that I've had over the years. So the first of them, the first story is from um, Cervantes's Don Quixote. Um, and it comes in the second part of Don Quixote, where Quixote is sitting in an inn um, with Sancho, um, and they watch a puppet, puppet show. And the puppet show is a puppet show of a romance. Um, it's about Charlemagne's daughter, Melisendra, who is being captured by the Moors. Um, and the puppets are showing how Don Guy, Guy Feroz, um rescues her from the Moors and brings her back. And all of a sudden, and this is what fascinates me about this um, particular episode, you know, you wouldn't think that Don Quixote would be the voice of reason in this particular novel, who picks up on those faults, but that's what he does. And this is what he says. Um, this is from the English translation of Sheldon, um, the 16th century translation. Child, child, cried Don Quixote aloud. On with your story in a direct line. Um, there you are out, boy, said Don Quixote. Master Peter is very improper in his bells. He's referring to the fact that the puppet keeper has rung some bells as sound effect in the puppet show. For amongst the Moors, you have no bells but kettle drums and a kind of shawms that be like our weights, so that your sounding of bells in Sanzuena is most idle foppery. And I love that moment where Quixote and behind Quixote, you can see looming Cervantes' own experience as a Moorish captive 
suddenly picking up on that little opposition, cultural opposition between the voice of the bells and the voice of the kettle drums. So that's a moment of opposition, perhaps. But the second example, the second story that has been in my head over the last few weeks, essentially, because it's part of this book that I'm writing at the moment, um, comes from 16th century Mughal India. And this is a moment where in 1613, a very ordinary um, East India Company factor or merchant called Christopher Farewell is lying in his bed in Ajmer on a full on a new moon night. And he can listen to the voices, the sounds of the city beyond his doors. His windows are closed, his doors are closed. Um, he's in the English factory. It's quite closely guarded. Um, but Farewell can hear this faint strains of singing that comes from Indian households of the city, because as he says, it's the festival of the new moon. And he stays up for hours listening. The women who he assumes to be the wives and concubines of the local gentry sing most melodiously, he would remember, with such elevated and shrill voices strained unto the highest, yet sweet and tunable rising and falling according to their art and skill, that I have been ravished in those silent seasons with the sweet echo or reflection thereof from a fair distance. Farewell's Christian European sensibilities kind of remind him that such singing really isn't prayer, it's superstitious, it's profane. But in his imagination, far from home, and in the heat of that Indian night, the language he gropes for is really telling, I think. It's biblical. The sound of psalms and harps of the Old Testament run right through it. The worshippers remind him or seem to him are shouting unto God with the voice of triumph. Then they anoint their heads with oil and their cups runneth over. So I'm going to stop there, I think, in this introduction. But the thing that I wanted to pick up on is how often when you're looking at early modern and particularly 16th and early 17th century cross-cultural encounters, either real or imagined, quite often you come across both of these and sometimes simultaneously that sense of anxiety about authenticity. How can you authentically mark difference and what role does sound play in it? You know, belts or drums, that is the question for Quixote. And the sense of how do you express what you hear? What are your own mental kind of sonic landscapes that you're drawing on? And how often does that drawing on that landscape sometimes enable you to cross boundaries that you're not even conscious of crossing, perhaps? So I'll stop there, Catherine. That's really lovely, and um, you know, reminds me of, of some of the work that I've I've done myself on notions of affinity and how, particularly how, how you know, coming at um, something you know completely cold that you've never experienced before. You know, what are the processes by which you actually learn to like something, or and perhaps even learn to feel it the way you're supposed to. Um, and this idea that there, there might be in sound um, a some form of experiential common ground um, that can be worked with there. So that's really lovely. Thank you. Uh, Sarah, over to you. Thank you. And uh, thanks again. It's yes, lovely company to be in. And um, thank you to the organizers of the conference, to Rachel and Emily, to, to give um, to give me a chance to think about this, this topic in more uh, detail. Um, I've just finished a, a dictionary of Shakespeare in London, and I guess um, so it's, it's a reference work, so there hasn't been much room for creative thinking, more kind of in-depth research. But I suppose doing it, I I sort of started to think about the 
um, the, the kind of uh, growing amount of really wonderful work that's been done on the immigrant population of London and really the work that's been done to push back against the narrative um, that London was all white in the 16th and 17th century. Um, and I suppose I'm interested in how that community um, contributed to the city um, and particularly what sounds they they brought in as well as all the other senses but what how they contributed to the to the very kind of noisy bustle of of the city and then kind of interrelated to that um, more kind of related to, to my other work is is the representation of other communities, um, other races on stage. Um, and, and we know it in this time period that all cues and sounds are so are such important signifiers on the early modern stage for providing shorthand to fictional worlds and to characters. Um, and I guess I was thinking about, I got, um, here's my prop, I got Henslow's diary out because I was thinking about the list in Henslow's diary, which is an account book of the Rose Theatre, of those, he has these wonderful props of uh, Mamet's head and the tomb of Dido. And so it gives us some insight into how, um, you know, the kind of the, the material culture, I guess, that um, other cultures were represented on stage, these, these characters from different worlds. But I wonder about the kind of the attending oral signifiers of sound um, that also sort of fed into um, that kind of representation. And um, I was I was thinking about um, particularly as Nandini was talking about the difference between bells and, and kettles. And I was thinking about kind of the, the, the sound of chaos and about um, this sort of link between on the early one stage, um, kind of devilry and chaos and cacophony um, and sound being very threatening. Um, it, it being one of the senses that, um, and Nandini talked about the anxiety of authenticity, um, which made me think about the anxiety about the ear as this, this open orifice that things can, can, can get into. And I think even, even more than other senses, I think there was this real anxiety about the ear. And I suppose it, for other cultures kind of permeating through, through the ear, um, and I guess, yeah, the sound of sort of chaos and long-standing cultural um, ideas about sound, thinking about the Old Testament. And um, I was thinking some of the work that I looked into was the, was the sort of sound effects or the scores of sound effects of individual plays and thinking how a lot in globe play, plays written for the globe and, and Shakespearean plays, there's a sense of a kind of score that tends to make crescendos of sounds and then create moments of silence and stillness, a real sort of fluctuating between. So I was thinking about the, the kind of the knocking in Macbeth, the knocking on the porter's door, and that links to the harrowing of hell. Um, and then in Othello, the alarm bell that keeps ringing after the fight between Cassio and Iago and Othello being the one that silences the alarm bell and kind of brings brings actually a moment of stillness and silence. So yeah, I'm just sort of thinking about, we're thinking about race and sound, um, I guess thinking about the long-standing cultural ideas, sh some shared and some not shared about sound and religion. Um, and also about, the kind of the opposite sound stillness and silence and how they function in the question of uh, representations of race on on stage or or even in a kind of wider um, off stage as well. Um, so yeah, I'll, I will leave it there. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you. And it's um and it's really interesting that you you bring up the connections with um the the old testament and, and the new testament because um uh, they they are so important to um travelers and travel writers as nandini of course knows <clears throat> particularly 
um, in the in the 16th and 17th century when they're actually encountering um, uh, the sounds of of um, races that they're oh, not races but peoples that they've um, uh, not encountered directly before and trying to make sense of them and they what they have is is a the Bible and b much longer standing um, uh, understandings of um, of Muslims. Um, and around the Mediterranean, actually, and they they often superimpose those understandings on, on India, which is which is fascinating. So you know that's I think that's another thread that we can we can pick up too. And um, our final speaker, Jennifer. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Um, it's it's very early here. <laughs> um, I as as the the excellent panelists are talking, I was thinking about, um, and Sarah's presentation made me think about the sonic color line as, as a formalized program for resisting or managing difference, right? For controlling that anxiety or attempting to control that anxiety that you're creates or created in, in European society. Um, the sonic color line in my book, it details the longstanding historical relationship between listening power and race in the modern world. It's theoretical in interventions twofold. One, to show how we understand, create, and experience the concept of race through sound and the meanings, judgments, and ideas that are attached to sound. And two, to document the construction of systemic racial discrimination performed through sound, the sonic color line, as well as to represent the aggregation of a racialized sonic norms and practices that center, empower, and reify whiteness that I call the white listening ear. Um, the immediate context of my study is the United States, but the implications of the sonic color line and the listening ear are devastatingly and infuriatingly far reaching geographically. I looked last night in Google Scholar and I found references to the sonic color line in over 25 countries and on every continent but Antarctica. Anti-Blackness and white supremacist ideologies are global and the reach of the sonic color line is horrifying, honestly. I'm humbled to have contributed toward its naming, its resistance, and through things like this, its eventual undoing. Um, the temporal span of my book is the mid 19th century to the middle of the 20th, but the historical aggregation of the white listening ear systemic normalization stretches into the past and threatens our future. I was actually on a panel a couple of weeks ago about um, the impact of the sonic color line on the development of speech recognition and in artificial intelligence, which now impacts everything from medical records to court data. Um, it's not just ordering from Alexa, but that can be really frustrating too. Um, and certainly while my books start in 1845 marks a particular intensification of the racialization of listening in American capitalism, the United States did not invent the sonic color line and the white listening ear. White elites built from European colonial and patriarchal structures and religious structures that shaped the early modern period before it. So I'm here today not just to affirm the excellence, you know, the, the firm and enjoy the excellent scholarship of my co-panelists, but because of my collaboration with um, my brilliant departmental colleague, David Sterling Brown, who's found the theoretical concepts of the sonic color line um, useful to his own studies of Shakespeare, race, and social justice. Many of you will remember our collaboration from the Folger Institute Critical Race Conversation last summer on the sounds of whiteness. And we've since been working on a co-authored piece about um, focusing specifically on Macbeth and the racialized soundscape where we examine how race as an ideology and a material practice happens among white people in the spaces that they, they dominate. Um, Macbeth has no somatically black characters, but there's a whole world of, of conversation and understanding about race being built in that play. So the making and performing of race is what creates white people in white spaces. And Shakespeare's um, often highly symbolic soundscapes give sound invisible, racialized, and critical power. Throughout Macbeth, um, I don't have time today to discuss the whole thing, but I will talk briefly about the play's opening sound, Thunder, um, and the, the representation of Thunder as this dangerous, chaotic, wild force, especially as it's deliberately contrasted to what emerge as civilized or orderly sounds in the play's assertion of, of you know, by the end, 
proper, you know, monarchical descent, um, things like trumpets, bells, drums, hot boys, etc. Um, 17th century Europeans thought about thunder quite differently than in the contemporary moment and cultivating a period ear matters in understanding the sound's racialized resonance. Richard Cullen Rath describes how English people in this era conceived of thunder as a palpable force, a speech act on the part of God or perhaps demons. Shakespeare's use of thunder to open both Macbeth and the Tempest exploits these meanings and layers on racialized impl implications as Europeans increasingly associated thunder and excessive storms with the so-called new world of the Western Atlantic and its existent population depicted as heathen and wild. Hurricane, for example, enters the English lexicon in 1555 in direct reference to weather patterns in the West Indies. By the 17th century, hurricane had become a metaphor in common speech describing, this is from the OED, a violent wish or commotion bringing with it destruction and confusion, um, a storm uh, and the tempest of words, cheers, etc. So this kind of sound of, of chaos, but one that's linked to new world storms where the colonizers perception of the indigenous people living in those places um, as violent, overly emotional, unintelligible, and, and noisy. So the usage of hurricane kind of polices the boundaries of whiteness and formation, ferreting out behavior that's deemed unseemly for good white people um, in Macbeth and dramatizing this fearful slippage, that anxiety about bad white people and the negative and dehumanized racialized identities of the colonial indigenous and enslaved others. Um, English sailors, for example, call Bermuda the Devil's Island because of the frequency of hurricanes there and their cultural understanding of thunder as demonic. So when you have the thunder opening with Beth, um, it heralds the presence of the witches, their tempting dark arts, but it also signals that, you know, the outskirts of Inverness are dangerous, they're chaotic, they're unholy, and the rest of the play is this kind of reimposition of the trumpets of the court, the drums of the military and the bells of the church in contrast with the thunder. And these are the sounds Shakespeare uses to represent and legitimize good white power and the use of violence to, to uphold it. So thank you. Thank you, that's um, really brilliant. Um, and I'm thinking about um, thunder and its different um, significations for different kinds of people. So um, one of the things that actually does link us as um, a global species is our experience of oceans and of um, oceanic uh, thunderstorms, um, which are you know weather events that are created off the land and uh, you know when the rain and then the rain you know and the thunder falls on the land and of course you have sea storms and so on um and something that struck me um was the very different interpretations of the meanings of thunder in the indian ocean worlds um to the idea of tempest being chaos um uh in um the malay world as barbara and dyer's work shows um thunder was regarded as 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 a signifier of power and, of, and a connection with supernatural power and a connection with sovereignty. And so the um, Malay sultans would draw down the thunder into their Nobat ensembles, which originated in the Mediterranean, this, the, the kettle drums, the shawms, everything else. They originate and they, they get um, uh, given as gifts from one sultan to another sultan all the way along the Indian Ocean um, and so they draw the thunder down into the Nobat and that is their sovereignty, it's their sovereign power. But I'm also thinking about the monsoon in India and the ways in which the monsoon um, is interpreted in, in, in early modern Indian literature as being the coming of joy, fertility, signifying the, the, the breaking of the, of the, the heat um, of relief um, all these connections with, you know, lovemaking of, of birds and animals and fertility of the earth and all of these kinds of things, which is a completely different understanding of thunder. Um, and of course, the monsoon can be devastating as well and create floods and death and everything else. But um, that really struck me that we actually, when we're thinking about sound, and, and I was talking about sound as a potential space in which affinities can be found and learned, but it's also a space in which ontologies of sound clash. 
well, ontologies clash. Um, so, so that's that's an important thing. But also thinking about um, about the, the the sonic color line um, and the the white listening ear and its origins in colonialism. Too, I think that's you know a really important point. And I'm also thinking of Duncan Robinson's um, hungry listening is um, uh, about um, the the um, the the hungry listening of of white settlers. Uh, for indigenous sounds um, and the, the the consumption of them, but also the misinterpretation of them. And you know, for those of us who who work on India, um, you get these. I, I Nandini, I love Christopher Farewell's beautiful, you know, evocation of the singing that he hears, uh, overhears um, of the the women, um, the secluded women. Um, it's absolutely beautiful, and he really appreciates what they're singing. Um, but you also get the beginnings of this idea of sound as heathenish um, or, or, or of, of other sound as heathenish. And the kind of, when you get through to the, you know, the, the 18th, 19th century in, in British writing about Indian music, Malay music, um, you know, of the incessant uh, beating of tom-toms and the heathenish noise and, you know, these kinds of things. Um, which, you know, is, <laughs> um, you know, there is, there is this sense in which our music is orderly and their music is noise. Um, and there are people who bridge that, but, you know, I, and, you know, so this is, this has been really, uh, very rich. Um, so, um, I think we've actually got quite a bit of time. Um, I wanted to, I wanted to ask, I, I, I do actually want to kind of continue with this with with this idea, but I, I'd like to ask um, sort of everybody if they would like to comment a little bit on um, on this notion of reaching for of, of, of you know sort of Europeans reaching for metaphors, ways of explaining what is being heard and the kinds of um, misunderstandings, um, or perhaps understandings that happen happen in that uh, in that process. Um, Wayne, I don't know if you want to begin, or, or begin with your, your 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 the thoughts that you've been having in relation to things that other people have been saying. Yeah. Um, well, I hope that you can still hear me clearly. Um, <laughs> it's good. Um, so, yeah. Immediately, what leaps to me is the writings of um, William Beckford of Summerley. And, and I'm working on three historians um, who are linked to um, Jamaica in the 18th century. So I'm working on um, Edward Long. And um, Edward Long has, you know, a very, um, well, what we would today describe simply racist, as, as racially um, let's say aggressive rhetoric um and then and then, and then there's another writer in the middle um, um whose whose writings are largely similar so i won't really talk about him but then when you get to william beckford um he, he's he talks a lot more about the nature of sounds and this is it's really making me think of storm tempest all these sorts of things but but william beckford is somebody interestingly links the sound of um, the, the the wide door flute, which he hears on one of his plantations, on one of his estates, being played by an overseer, um, a, a black and African origin overseer, and he um, equates this sound to melancholy. And I always think to myself, you know, where is he getting the sense of melancholy from? Where does why why do why why do these authors, him in particular, but there are others too? Who pick on this trait of the music sounding melancholic when they know it might actually have nothing to do with melancholy, it's just to do with the way that it affects them. And this is making me very much think about what Nandini was saying about, you know, the, the way how sounds, um, how, how you begin to learn an appreciation for sounds. And this is all very messy in my brain, as you can probably hear. Um, but we get this situation in Jamaica where, where, where you get writers writing in very different ways. Or what I'm trying to prove is that the writing that comes out of 18th century Jamaica 
is, 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 is written in socially contrived ways. So what's written for the home market is actually quite different to what is written for um, consumption by the British Metropole. Um, and so um, you get, you, you'll, you'll read um, an explanation of a theatrical performance, which talks very honestly about the fact that the performance was quite bad at some point. And then you see um, in, a, in a text like Edward Long's History of Jamaica, um, where he doesn't really talk about the theater culture in, in 18th century Jamaica, in, in Kingston, for example. He doesn't really talk about it at all. It goes on. It goes undiscussed and uncommented on as though it's some, you know, um, unquestionable event or, or industry or institution. And instead you get this um, just a commentary, but an outsider commentary on, on, on the Afro-Jamaican musical customs. And so this is also what William Beckford of Summerlin is doing. He's, he's commenting very much on the, on the, on the Afro-Jamaican performance and trying to find things to link it with his own experience as much as possible. Um, yeah, it's not really metaphorical, <laughs> but it's about as close as the texts on 18th century Jamaica allow me to, to get really. You do get, of course, performances of Shakespeare on the stage in Kingston and performances of all of the ballad offers, or many of the ballad offers from the same period in, in London being performed in, 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 in Jamaica as well. Um, yeah, it's really difficult to work out what that would have meant to the individuals um because there were very few diaries um so there are a few sources i should perhaps leave it there um but yeah i'll leave it there and i'll let somebody else take on and yeah no that's that's absolutely that's absolutely fascinating um i, I don't know if one of our panelists would like to respond to to, to wayne but also, also to my my question about this this the, the gap nandini um, uh, no, I think this is a really interesting topic, but while Wayne was talking about it and about the metaphors that were being used, I was trying to think about other instances. And the one that comes to my mind quite naturally is someone I've been working on for quite a while, um, a Jesuit priest called Thomas Stevens, who went to Goa in um, India in the 16th century learned the local languages Konkani and Marathi um, and he again uses reaches out for biblical metaphors to describe the sound of Konkani so he has this beautiful kind of description very ly lyrical description of Marathi and he's singing the praises of the language um, and in the original kind of Konkan Marathi dialect it turns out to be a weird mixture of Sanskrit slokas, um, Sanskrit imagery, combined with essentially the, the lyrical weight of the Songs of Solomon. But I was wondering whether there is something happening there which later on take on a kind of proleptic effect because of this. So if you're a European traveler going to India, going to the Middle East in this period, the one kind of common lyrical or rhetorical language you have available to you talking about this old world is biblical, right? Um, so that's what you reach out to, to describe this world. But proleptically, what that also does is push this world in Goa, in India, in the Middle East into the past. And we see that happening repeatedly in travel narratives of the 16th century, where it's one of those great wonders that, you know, there are people from England who are going there in the 1610s, 1614, 1620s. The Mughal Empire is not a very old empire at this stage. It's a fairly new young one. But the language they use is of um, an empire that is coming to its dying days. The language they use is the language of the past, of something that is already moved out of eyesight in a way. And I wonder whether there is something happening there in terms of the soundscapes and the mental landscapes that are so keen or attuned to the biblical, which is being imposed on this and therefore pushing it almost out of time in a way. That is an absolutely fascinating question, and I'm hoping that um, that um, Sarah, Jennifer, Wayne might might pick up on that. Um, and and 
why it's it's so compelling is because of course later in the 18th century um writers like william jones explicitly push oriental music into the past um to, yeah. it, it, to, and of course because his interests were in a comparison between the indo um, European languages, so between Sanskrit and Latin and Greek. So, so he pushed um, Hindustani music and other what he called Oriental musics, including uh, Persian music, into the um, past of antiquity rather than the past of the Bible. But I, but that kind of denial of coevalness, which is a theme of Orientalism and of racism um, and, and cultural racism, is definitely that it's, that's a really really important insight there um i'm wondering if, if jennifer or sarah would like to come in at this point sarah yeah i was as, as uh, you were talking i was thinking about Koryat and i was thinking about um the way in which um Koryat, you know particularly with his um uh, when he meets the courtesans, how he is striving for a safe language um, for this encounter that is clearly very dangerous, but exotic and intoxicating. And um, I guess I was thinking about the, the, the way in which not only does it push the, um, I, I really like the idea of kind of pushing that kind of encounter out of time, but also pushing it somewhere uh, to, a, to a language and a metaphor and an interpretation that is very safe and, and very familiar and therefore very knowable. Um, so it, it's that, that, that way in which you interpret something which, which neutralizes the effect in some way and, and that that must uh, run across these, these encounters throughout the period. Building, yeah, sorry, Jennifer. Oh, yeah. I was okay, building from that, I was thinking about um, connecting ideas about time and I guess also about um, you know that time is a time is linear and time is progress and this kind of border between like the wild and the civilized is also a, a, a chronology and what does it mean to yeah. kind of push um, push these sounds into that space of, of wildness and then bringing it back to Christianity to think about kind of sound as the last expression of, I guess, bodily control or, or like ideas about the body and what the body is supposed to do and, and what is dangerous, what is tempting, what is, um, so I think definitely like the, the time and, and religion and, and power and the body and patriarchy are all kind of tangled up. Um, uh, there was a question that's related I saw in the chat um, yeah. from Catherine Fletcher about thunder as, as a sound of artillery and gunpower in military. And I think it's directly connected to back to this idea of thunder as God's power and, and God's wrath. And, you know, when I talked about bells in opposition to thunder, I, I meant that actually in a really literal way that church bells were often rang during thunderstorms to kind of ward off. Thunder was thought to be the dangerous part of the storm. Um, that's why they're, they're, you know, that name thunderstorms kind of still retains it as opposed to electrical storms or, or lightning storms. So a lot of the bells would be inscribed with, with Latin phrases about warding off the thunder and about kind of attracting um, kind of God's forgiveness and so in some ways, like, you know, uh, that's kind of a, a marshalling of God's power or an assumption of God's power being on your side, which again, connects to the idea of colonialism, hungry for land. This is God's will over to the US manifest destiny um, that all of those things are kind of wrapped up. And Macbeth again is about, you know, the good kind of violence, right? The war is the good kind of violence, the drums, the mil like organized violence um, is the good kind. Macbeth's kind, the passionate, the hungry, the that's the bad kind that that needs the the warding off and controlling. So in looking at those kind of, you know, there's a lot in there. But yeah, yeah. Yeah. And connecting the ideas about I love Wayne, that that idea about like the what how did you phrase it? Socially contrived ways oh. uh, of listening and writing about like who's going to be your audience, who's going to read this. 
how do they want to formally shape people's ideas about sound versus how their own internal feelings are. And the listening ear is very much about that socially contrived idea of how things should sound and what, you know, and kind of the, probably the, I'm thinking again, the anxiety, the, the fear of pleasure in the sounds of the other and the fear of, of liking it, loving it. What does that mean? If, does that mean you're being tempted like Macbeth? Yeah, absolutely. And that's, I mean, that's, that's, you know, and I also like the idea of, 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 um, of drums and, and, uh, you know, sort of military bands and instruments actually being sort of organized thunder, <laughs> um, as opposed to chaotic thunder, uh, which comes up. There's, um, I'm going to open the, the floor to, to, to more questions. And there is one in the, in the, in the chat, uh, one of, uh, on which I have particularly strong views, <laughs> which, so I'll, I'll keep out of it for, for, for the moment. But um, the question is, this is more a general question about our terminology and points of reference. How do we as scholars contribute to the sonic color line? And this is really very, very important. For example, ethnomusicology to encompass quote unquote all non-Western music. And it's present in other disciplines too. I don't mean to pick on the musicologists. Go right ahead because it's a big problem. <laughs> um, do we need to think about how we continue to other through our frames of reference? Um, and I'm 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 actually going to ask um, Wayne and then Jennifer to speak to this because they specifically work on 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 music, and then perhaps for Nandini and 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 Sarah if they have something to add. But but Wayne, <laughs> what's your view on the ethnomusicology musicology question? Yeah. Um, I mean, the definitely, I mean, the over, uh, yes, massively. Um, I, I do believe that we, we, we really need to, to, to think about how, how, how we other through, through the frames of reference. And musicology is full of this. And this is why I'm doing the kind of PhD I'm doing, basically, where I try to, to decenter and to, and to read against, to quote um, uh, Marissa Fuentes, to read against the bias line, basically, this grain of bias and this grain of, 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 of the idea that taste means Europeanness in music. Um, and how do you decenter that in a colonial context? This is why I've really made it difficult for myself by writing on the period 1760 to 1810, because it's, it's right at the, at the pinnacle of, 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 of um, British, um, at, the, at the height of British imperialism, let's say, in, in, in colonialism. Um, in, 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 in the period of free slavery, anyway, um, legal slavery, sorry. Um, so, yeah, I think one of the ways that I'm trying to demonstrate or work out if this is possible is by centering and the other experience as much as possible, you know, writing from a different perspective, writing in ways that, um, that, that force your, your, your readership to, to, to question and to, um, to just to complicate the traditional narratives really i think that's if, if i if i feel that i've complicated the situation and said actually you know in the case of 18th century kingston music is going on but the population is mainly black people you know yes european music is going on but the people that are listening to this music are overhearing it are not actually a intentional audience who are they how can we begin to find out a little bit more about them um and of course that means that you are spending a lot of time in the archive and, and so it forces you as a researcher to, to really, um, you know, kind of self-reflect and, and, and to think about how you, in, in your own response to these texts, how you try to destabilize and not just regurgitate the narrative, which of course the classical music industry, this is what classical music does. It says Haydn, Beethoven, Mozart, Bach, they're amazing musicians. Why are they amazing? <laughs> And we look for similar features in all of their music um, and, and, and an aspect of musicology needs to do something different is what I'm trying to say, or well, historical musicology needs to do something different. How? It's up for grabs, but this is one way of doing it anyway. Thank you, Wayne. Jennifer, I don't know if you want to come in here. Yes, that is a really important question and Wayne's points are, are absolutely fundamental um, and also the way um, that Wayne earlier brought up Saidiya Hartman's work in the archive and Saidiya Hartman's ideas about speculative, speculative history. And you know that one of the things, one of the justifications for the 
perspectives on sound and music in musicology and other disciplines is that this is what's in the archive, right? Treating the archive as this kind of neutral space that everything that was good or worthwhile was collected and thinking about the structural racism in archival building, the structural racism in kind of defining music as something that can that has a written European notation and is able to be represented in European notation and preserved. Um, that even that music should be preserved if you look at Dylan Robinson's work um, in Hungry Listening, or that you know songs must have authors in order to be valued as opposed to you know things marked traditional or anonymous and even those being marked that way. So kind of looking at those structural value terms and and just because it isn't in the archive doesn't mean that it didn't exist. I think is really you know always important to keep in mind and and finding. Um, as we mentioned, finding those fragments and being able to build from those fragments. For me, um, it's also about kind of not looking at at other, not even thinking about other musics as other musics at all, that that not having an additive approach where like, here's this European foundation and then, um, you know, adding in these, these um, other musics, it's actually about challenging the origin stories of what is music? What is the cultural value of music? How, do, how did musical aesthetics come about? For whom? Um, and I think it's also important in my work, I center black audiences and black audiences reactions to um, the various musical performers that I'm looking at, um, ideas about noise. And you know, at the same time as I'm challenging my own assumptions and ontologies, how I came to know what I know and and think what I think about sound and music as a white woman in the US, doing that work internally, externally, really blowing open this idea of, you know, who is the audience, what is music, what are the origin stories of, of the field and reorganizing that. Yeah, thank you. I mean, that, that's that's fantastic. There, there is actually another question specifically for Jennifer in the chat, but I want to ask Nandini or Sarah if they would like to respond to this. Um, I mean, um, yes, I, 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 I will leave my views out of it for, <laughs> for now. If there's time at the end, I'll share them. But, um, but, but Nandini. Catherine, I was just going to ask you, actually, because I think it would be really interesting to have your views on on this, given the collective presence here. I just muted myself. That was <laughs> um, yeah. Um, so I. So uh, for those of you who don't know, I. Um, I'm somebody who works entirely on Indian music, uh, entirely in the past. Um, so before the period of recorded sound, the material that I work with, it's gone beyond recall. We can't recover the sound, or we, you know, we can try to sort of, sort of try but 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 we, we can't re recover the sound um and in fact the book that i'm finishing at the moment its subtitle is histories of the ephemeral and its question is um can orpheus ever bring eurydice back from the dead can we ever know what it was like to be there to hear these things um when we don't have the kind of prescriptive notation that we do and actually that's a bit of a that's a bit of a myth anyway um but and the answer is no, but what's interesting is the journey. And one of the things that's important to recognize about Mughal India is that it is just heaving, heaving with sources, incredibly rich detailed sources on music, sound, listening, and incredibly highly developed aesthetic. Um, and um, in and, and not just in the in the Mughal Empire, but but in the um, Hindu states and um, and English and French. Um, authors write about it, um, uh, but just, just it just goes on and on and on. I could not possibly spend um, less than probably about a thousand lifetimes working on this ocean of amazing, beautiful things. Nobody had ever worked on it in ethnomusicology really before I looked, because the field of ethnomusicology is predicated on the idea that um, if you're looking at non-Western music, that we are looking at the music of the people without history or people outside our history. So you look at them anthropologically. And this is an, uh, this is something that I'm, I'm getting from Walter Mignola's work on museums that you that what happens in the colonial period is you get two different types of museums which um, come into being. One is the, uh, the art museum, um, which is the museum of the people with history, i.e. Western Europeans, 
<laughs> um, and then you get the Ethnographic Museum, which is the museum for the people without history or outside history. And that split is there between musicology and ethnomusicology. It's been there since the night since the 1880s. And it needs to go. It needs to go. Um, there is no reason why um, people cannot study the history of all sorts of music all over the world. It shouldn't just be um, Western music that gets treated as if it has a history. All musics have history and lots and lots and lots of them have archival and, and archeological sources to do that history. Um, similarly, there's really no reason why anthropology um, should be restricted as it so very much is to, um, to the non-West um, because you know, the anthropological insights of say the work of Georgie Bourne on um, Western um, music institutions, you know, British, French, um, is, is absolutely revelatory. Um, we, the color line runs right down the middle of our discipline. And until that is recognized and we essentially start again, <laughs> um, the color line's gonna stay. And that is anathema to me. I think to just think that's wrong. So, so yes, yeah, so that's my very strong <laughs> controversial views. I'm gonna, gonna shock everybody. We have, we, have, um, we have four more minutes. There's a couple of more questions. There's one for Jennifer. Um, <laughs> I love the last one. I'm just wondering how long ago did the Times gain the, gain the nickname, the Thunderer? Um, I don't know if anybody knows, um, but if somebody, perhaps if somebody, you know, one, one of the members of the audience knows, might, might put that in the, the chat on, on Crowdcast. Um, Oh yes, and last Saturday I found myself playing cricket against a team called the Thunderers, <laughs> possibly of theatrical origin. Um, yeah, I, yeah, the, the the idea of, of, of you know um, being thunderously angry about something, uh, and you know then getting on your pulpit <laughs> or your or your soapbox and yelling about it, uh, perhaps. But um, but yes, Jennifer, um, and um, we we've got we've got three minutes. This is one last question. For Jennifer, I find your point about the white listening ear really interesting. Race is often, if not always, perceived visually, but once you brought up the white listening ear, I realized how sound is also weaponized against BIPOC2. An example of this is when Black, Indigenous, and people of color speak perfect English, but due to their accent, they're corrected on their pronunciation. Do you believe that this is a form of microaggression that upholds imperialist attitudes? The short answer of that question, because we only have three minutes, is yes, absolutely. Um, and I think part of what the sonic color line, the listening ear, do is kind of create this constant. You know, I think in the book I call it a shell game, moving between the visual and the aural um, of race. Right? It's the idea that well, everyone's you know in the U.S. you know the discourse of color blindness, and then this kind of accentism um, and discrimination in terms of accents is well that kind of ties ties. Um, the visually raised body back to back to racial hierarchy. But then I'd also say even the idea that there is a perfect English to be spoken is part and parcel of the sonic color line and that that is a disciplining factor in terms of finding a, a place a good place to live, finding a job that also um, needs to be undone. And you know I think I would love to ask um, I was really interested in, um, Sarah's work on immigrant populations in London and how the idea of immigration in terms of sound um, was part of that world in the early modern period and what that might teach us in the contemporary moment about listening and immigration. Great. Sarah, do you want to have a very quick 30 seconds? Yeah, I suppose it's the idea of sort of uh, living cheek by jowl, I, I think, in London and, and neighbour to neighbour. And uh, we've been, again, thinking about the kind of the history of the subject. We have been constructed a, um, a particular agenda that says um, there weren't any people of colour in London. And actually, we know that that wasn't the case and people did live in close proximity with each other quite happily. Um, it's lots of them in the neighborhood, Southwark, where, where Shakespeare had, had the, the Globe was and the theater community was. Um, so 
I do think that these overarching narratives that we we have been left with as scholars today have to be torn away in order to find um, the, the the reality of lived experience um, of people of the past and their, li their lived um, or oral experience and how they um, shared culture um, in ways that, uh, as, as Catherine said, are, are ephemeral and perhaps lost to us, but are still possible, I think, to, to reconstruct and um, to, to have access to, I would say. Thank you. We've just been told we can run over by five minutes, which is good because there's just, there are a couple of other questions in the chat, which I'm, I'm, I'm delighted to, to, to see. Um, th this one is, is, is for all of us. Um, this is such an inspiring conversation. Thank you. The points made about developing new ways to think and work with the archive as a way to change that familiar musicology story is so important and fascinating. And I would say not just musicology, but, but sonic history, auditory history, um, all the kinds of work that we're doing, um, work with performed sound of whatever kind. Um, I wonder if you could share, reflect on the kinds of evidence your work is drawing you attention to and the difficulties you experience finding and working with the evidence. Um, and um, Sarah, do you want to speak to this to start off with? Sure, yeah, uh, yes. Um, I was just thinking about um, uh, when, when we were talking about this issue of that, that old archaeological adage, which is, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence and I just think it's so important to to re remember that when we're dealing with these um these these evidences these times um and also the um the importance of um the work that's been done around historical phenomenology and um thinking about bodies in space and history and 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 actually that for a long time, um, I guess in scholarship, there was a real reticence to um, engage with the body and senses in a historical context. And that recent work on um, something about Bruce R. Smith's work and around historical phenomena phenomenology has certainly really helped me to, um, I think, to to have uh, to have kind of faith in in the evidence, or at least to ask to not necessarily have the evidence but to ask better questions um as Catherine was saying it's about it's not about the answers to the question it's about the journey to the question um and that asking the question and asking better questions of the material that survives is is a is an important thing to do in scholarship yes absolutely um, Nandini, do you have something, uh, uh, basically a last word, because we've, we, again, we've, we find ourselves for three minutes. So if you have a last word on this particular question of evidence. Sure. Um, this is something that we, uh, we have been grappling with, with the research project that I run, which is about travel and identity, essentially, in London. Um, and the big problem, perhaps, is that there is very little narrative heft or mass that you can spin research around. And that, that has partly been the problem, I think, in the sense that res research quite often likes to have a mass that it can kind of orbit around. And in this case, quite often, the evidence that we get is fragmentary. Um, it's evidence that is present in lacunae in other texts of various kinds, from parliamentary records to court proceedings to tax statements perhaps. Um, so in some ways, I think it's not so much the problem of evidence, but of methodology in terms of how we present that. And that's what we are having to grapple with repeatedly. How do you spin your narrative and do justice to these little traces of voices, the little tinkling of the bell, the little clink of glass, Italian glassworks in London, the little glimpse of a Turkish voice? in Venice, how do you do justice to that when you don't have anything beyond those fragments? Absolutely, uh, the, the, the chapter I'm just, just finished of my book is, is about the name of a, of a courtesan in the, um, the margins of a set of financial records um, and sort of spinning out of that. And we actually know very little about her at all, but there's actually so much you can find if you kind of just trace the web 
around. Um, Jennifer and Wayne. Jennifer first. Oh my goodness, I have to follow that amazing description of sound methodology. Nandini, that was fantastic. That's how I feel a lot. It's kind of like I'm, you know, moving from, I won't say stitching them together, but moving from fragment to fragment in terms of, of thinking about these histories. Um, in some ways, I think that's how sound itself works and why it is such a potent symbol is that, you know, in a, when you, in a Shakespeare, you know, in a play where you hear that bell tinkle, it's like, you know, part of how it works is in the listeners, it, you know, calls forth all of these memories and associations. So in some ways, I think, you know, the way that methodologically we approach these things is, is a bit how sound itself works in connecting these fragments in this very powerful way. Um, I would say, I guess, one of the things that I've encountered, especially in the sonic color line, is thinking about um, the development of auditory science and actually how many of the scientists, Helmholtz and Corti and others who are at this point, you know, beginning to diagram the ear and, you know, European scientific experimentation is also very much bound to ideas about music. And many of them were classical musicians. They played piano, they played. And so thinking about the way that the science that are structuring the things that we're talking about itself is very culturally bound. And how can we begin to, to kind of untangle that too, in terms of opening up you know, ideas about sound, its relationship to the body, and um, Catherine, like you said, the various um, you know ways of knowing about sound around the world. Yeah, thank you. And final word to Wayne. Yeah, um, I recognise that my computer is just telling me my connection is unstable, so I'll be really brief. Um, yeah, I think what I'm really thinking about is um, the fact that um, evidence sometimes comes in the obvious places. Sometimes you have to be looking in um, the, the in, in spaces for things that are basically hidden in plain sight. And so one of the best sources for me is, is, is newspapers of the period um, where, you know, or, or sometimes as well when you can get hold of them, and this is quite difficult in the global pandemic, but vestry account minutes. We've talked a lot about bells. We've talked a bit about Richard Cullen Rath's work here. And I just want to touch on something that happened in 18th century Jamaica, which was that bell ringing had to happen for a certain amount of time. It was dependent on um, the occasion and the person related or the people related to the occasion. And so what we have is that the death of a, a white person, bells are told for longer than they are told for a person that's called a free person of color. So sound is really linked to meanings and it's racialized. Um, and it gets really interesting. Um, and that is, you know, an account, you know, of, of, of a funeral. You never think about the fact that, well, bells will have rung before and after that funeral and what that would have meant and the fact that, you know, different people were listening. Um, and from there, it just unravels and you end up looking to trace the web. And, and, and this, yeah, is what it's all about. But this is stuff that it creates in the writer a sense of horror and despair and joy at times. And, and yeah, I mean, it's a roller coaster. It really is. Um, I think I'll end on that point. Thank you. And, you know, I think all of us experience those those joys and, and horror. Really, when, when dealing with race, there are some really horrible things that we do have to encounter um, in the archive. But perhaps uh, that is for another day. It remains uh, for me to thank um, my brilliant co-panelists, Sarah, Nandini, Wayne, and Jennifer um, for a really fantastic panel. And to thank Rachel and Emily too for um, putting together this wonderful uh, conference and for inviting us to speak. 